he talks about the phrase I like to use is the judicious embellishment of charts. So those words to me are really what hit home because you have data and you're showing charts, but there are some times where you want to embellish them with a photograph, an image, an icon, a logo, uh, and you want to do that in a way that's judicious. Now, that's the gray area. That was Ben Jones of dataliteracy.com. And in this episode today, we're going to really dive into what data literacy means, why you as an individual or as a company really should be thinking about building up this kind of practice or this kind of skill within your organization, and then actually how to go about it, like very tactically what it means and what it will bring to your organization. But before we do, of course, make sure to like, share, and subscribe this episode. If you're on a podcast player, please leave us a review to let everyone else know that this is something that needs to be heard. So without further ado, here is Ben Jones of dataliteracy.com. Ben Jones, welcome to the show, man. How are you? Thank you, Ben. I'm doing well. How are you? Great. You, you're the first Ben to be on besides <laughs> myself. So I right. appreciate that. Um, and, and we, you know, like we were just talking about, we've known each other 10 years or so, something like that, almost eight, eight and a half, nine, 10 years. And and when we met, you were in LA, I think, and doing some data stuff. Mm -hmm. And shortly thereafter, I think, because when you made the move up north. So tell me about that transition. Mm -hmm. Like, what were you doing back in LA? Because that's where you're from, I think, right? Yeah, I was born in Toronto, but I spent most of my life in the LA area up in Ventura County since I was a little kid. My family moved down there and we um, you know, sort of moved the whole family. And yeah, in LA at that time, when we met, I had just started a blog at Data Remixed. And it was the early days of the Tableau community. And, you know, not long after the launch of Tableau Public. So at that time, I was really just getting into the Tableau world, writing about data visualization. You know, I had spent some time after engineering, doing Lean Sigma and learning about statistical analysis and helping people with their projects and continuous improvement. So, you know, that was really kind of my foray into that uh, data world. And that time we met at that event down in San Diego, um, it was really kind of a pivotal turning point for me in my career. I was in the Iron Viz contest and um, Mm -hmm. was being recruited by some other companies. I think you, did you end up working for Facebook for a while? I did. Yep. Okay. I thought so. Yeah, that's right. So I think right around that same time, maybe shortly after you left, they were recruiting me as well as a few other companies. They needed another Ben. They needed more (laughs) Ben. That was the... (laughs) Yeah. I heard your name is Ben and I heard you like working with data, maybe a Tableau. Okay. Yeah. You're in. You're in. (laughs) So yeah. So I said no. Right. Exactly. I said no to them and also another dream job at ESPN. It was a little bit of a surprise to me how quickly, maybe about a year and a half after launching a silly little data blog that people wanted to hire me. And the reason why I said no to both of those dream jobs was because I had a chance to join Tableau up in Seattle to head up the Tableau public platform. And Mm -hmm. I figured, you know, I was already marketing for them anyway, so might as well do it, you know, (laughs) for a real job. So I did that. And then, uh, yeah, so then it was a great run with them, you know, great company. And then it was fun being part of the IPO, fun sort of seeing the community continue to blossom. And then, um, got to a place where I realized actually I was going to be able to contribute more, helping people in a more maybe tool agnostic way, covering mm-hmm. some of the concepts that I was seeing that I was seeing people miss in their use of that tool and others, uh, and perhaps maybe also causing them to make some mistakes. But also just trying to be part of a movement where we help other people that are even maybe intimidated by data. We call them data phobic, you know, and trying to help them. <laughs> also become become confident you know so that is yeah. why i left in 2018 to to start my company yeah yeah so you were there for for a good a good chunk of time did a lot and it was on the tableau public side so people that if you're unfamiliar yeah. at all uh that's kind of the free version of it but it's also mm-hmm. kind of the community side of it would you would you yeah. say that's fair i think fair? so it's a community it's a community enabler right because it lets right. people in the community share and use the software to do cool things. And I think you don't really see that with a lot of the other BI companies. And frankly, I don't know why they haven't figured out that that's a, a mm-hmm. pretty, pretty cool part of Tableau strategy. Um, yeah. And I also yeah. was involved with the academic programs team at the end and then walked away from the Tableau public piece a bit and just started doing what you call technical evangelizing, which didn't involve any baptismals or anything like that as far as <laughs> I was concerned. But uh, 
yeah, we were out there just talking to companies and trying to help them get better use of uh, of the software they had purchased, right? So great, great, yeah. That's it is interesting because I know I was just doing, um, or I'm in the middle of recording a Power BI course right now, mm-hmm. and and part of the setup, I'm going through it, going, wow, this is kind of like lame and cumbersome. I'm like, why are you, why isn't this just like a free tool that anyone in the world can download oh, yeah. and whatever? So, yeah. you know, it's just kind of like what Tableau did. And I think that was, you know, the whole democratization thing really like right. was, was to the heart of it. So, so, okay. So, so that was, mm-hmm. so that was pretty formative. It sounds like in your whole career yeah. path. And then now, yeah. now what are you doing? Tell me what your company's mm-hmm. all about. Mm-hmm. And then I'm just going to pepper sure. you with questions as we kind of go down here. Okay. Yeah. So uh, while I was at Tableau, I also had written a book and was teaching at the University of Washington. And that got me hooked on creating content and teaching. So that's why I left Tableau uh, to start up data literacy at dataliteracy.com. So our motto is to help people learn the language of data. And we do that by training them, by helping them assess their baseline and come up with a plan for growth and development and providing other resources, you know, we kind of see our organization as having a few main lanes of, of um, impact. So we're working B2B with businesses to help them train on site or virtually or through on demand uh, courses like you make. Uh, also B2C. So we're looking at just individuals that may don't, maybe don't have an employer, you know, who's willing to pick up the tab. So we're trying to help them too. And then lastly, sort of learning from the Tableau public days trying to just help in general, you know, with free resources. Um, I learned from Tableau Public that if you just do good stuff and put it out there, you know, generally it comes back to benefit others as well as you. So we've been trying to do um, some more things on our blog, on our resource page, partnering with, with some other organizations out there to, you know, raise the overall level of water level. The more I think uh, we as a society are able to use data effectively, I think the better off we'll be and tackling some of the challenges in front of us. Also, just as individuals, you know, there's things we can each work on, fitness, finances, health, and uh, Mm -hmm. data can be a part of that too. So trying to kind of see data a little more expansive than just companies, I suppose. Yeah, Um, yeah. So so what is, how would you define data literacy? I've heard similar Mm -hmm. terms in the past, but like this seems, you know, so what do you define that as? Yeah. Yeah. So I I think the definition for me is the ability to read, write, create, and communicate data as information. Happens to be the Wikipedia definition, although that's not (laughs) authoritative. It's it's what it is, you know. I've seen some different definitions as well. And ultimately I think it's trying to encompass the breadth of what it means to work effectively with data. And so that's really broad, right? That's really, really wide and it encompasses a lot of knowledge and skills. Uh, I think the reason why literacy is a helpful, uh, I guess, uh, analogy is because uh, for, for a couple of reasons. One, you know, um, we're trying to trying to make it um, feel approachable for people that may be intimidated by data. So, you know, for example, compare it to something like I want to become an expert or a master or fluent or something like that in a skill that might feel like a pretty high bar. So we're trying to start off by, by just saying, let's just focus on becoming more literate, you know, and that I think is a good starting point. Um, I think uh, there is also an important message that it's no, there's no such thing as someone who is illiterate. I mean, that doesn't work really. (laughs) We all, we all have kind of a, a built in or born in set of capabilities with respect to data. You know, you look at a chart, you see an outlier. So does someone who's never worked with data. It's just sort of part of the way our brain works. And so that's why a lot of what we do when we teach and train is to help people realize things they already know and just help them label that mm. and understand that that's part of the, uh, the skill set is things that they already possess maybe. Yeah. So, so let's get into that. So, so what does that process look like? Right. So if uh, you're coming into a company that maybe has a fledgling data practice of some sort, mm-hmm. uh, maybe yeah. they have, you know, a couple folks in different teams that are you know, pulling together some kinds of charts or, you know, those kind of things. Like what, what are the steps that you go through, right? Like like what, Mm -hmm. how do you uh, teach, you know, people the language data? Yeah. So one thing we start with uh, early on is an assessment called that we call the data literacy score. And what we're trying to do is help them think pretty uh, broad and expansively about um, their, their organization's ability to make effective use of data. In other words, it isn't just about teaching them tool X or tool Y. It isn't just about standardizing what charts are or aren't okay. 
it's more than that, right? Because what if we b- purchased all these fancy tools and put them through all this amazing training, but they don't even have access to data? Or even worse, maybe they do, but the processes don't even allow them to contribute. You know, they're going to get frustrated and leave. And I think that we've seen a lot of that happen in the early days here of the, this data science wave. People saying, look, you know, I just got all this training, but the leaders aren't even letting me be part of the decisions. And so we're just sitting here working on pet projects that aren't really moving the needle. And so we're trying to help them through the data literacy score, think about their overall organization along seven categories. Purpose, is our data connected to what we're doing or or side projects, right? Ethics, Mm -hmm. is it actually helping people or is it doing harm? And what do our people think about that? Um, And then of course, there's the the triad of people, process and technology. You know, do do our people have the right knowledge and skills? Are our processes working efficiently? What about the tech stack? Does it work together? Is it a little clunky? You know, and then the last two are the data itself is a separate category. Is it sufficient? Is there are there major quality issues? Is it timely and fresh? Um, and then lastly, culture is this actually rewarded here? Is this something that people have the message that if you use data and use it well, you're going to be rewarded, and that will help us succeed. It'll help your career grow. And we're giving you access to not just training, but communities and networking opportunities. And there's so much more that you can do and that you can give people than just a training program. So that's where we start. And the reason is because we want to let them know right up front, it isn't just about training. Your path is going to have to encompass and incorporate many things beyond what we are going to directly do for you. And so you have to come up with um, an idea of what the pain points are, a plan to try to resolve some of them. And oftentimes in the course of the survey, we do find out that the people are saying we need more training. And then we ask them what, what kind of training, because if what they really need is training in the systems of the company, then guess what? They, they need to do that themselves. They need to come up with a team to do that. If they're saying, yeah, we need to learn a tool. Great. I mean, there's some great resources out there. You can learn those things for free in some cases, you know, but if they're also saying, look, we just don't even really understand what data means and we're confused. And that's where we say, well, that's where our programs can help you because we're trying to help convince and convey uh, that message of confidence, right? That I know what data is, what its power and value is. I understand how it applies to me and how people use it. That's all of our uh, fundamentals program. Level one right now is, you know, all about reading charts and graphs. It doesn't matter what tool you made it in. I mean, if you can read uh, a dashboard and interact with one, it could be Power BI like uh, like you talked about and you're working on right now. It could be a Tableau dashboard. Heck, it could be Excel. You know, there's some cases of that. Of course, each of those scenarios has their own strengths and drawbacks. But at the end of the day, the people interacting with those dashboards need to be able to read them and interpret them. They also need to be able to know what to watch out for because it's easy to be misled by a chart. As you know, we've all been there. So, Mm -hmm. yeah, so those are the things we're trying to do on the training side of it, along with maybe just giving them our general recommendations about other things they can do kind of from a consulting point of view, but we've been really light on consulting, except maybe the assessment piece. We've really just been helping them come up with a roadmap, helping actually deliver the training, whatever they want, right? In person, virtual, on demand, those different modalities. We're trying to meet them where they are, customizing it if we can to include their visuals, their data sets. So that's kind of the game plan for us. You know, We've been able to work with a handful of organizations here out of the gate. We're in year three. And it's been a lot of fun, you know, working with nice. people all over the world. Yeah. So with that, do you come into a lot of companies? I mean, something, you know, that I was thinking of as you were going through that assessment process is that, mm-hmm. it, it, you know, like I, I've had uh, more than one job because the CIO went to a conference and heard the word business intelligence or something mm-hmm. and was like, mm-hmm. hey, I need that. <laughs> yeah. uh, let's yeah, go find yeah. someone. Let me just search. Hey, the business, you're the guy. Hey, come here. Now, do you, right. I mean, so, so, so when you, you, when you work with these companies, the folks you've, you guys worked with, uh, what do you find more often? Is it that, we already mm-hmm. have a bunch of tools and a bunch of people and no direction mm-hmm. or, mm-hmm. or is it, Hey, before we go buy a bunch of tools and hire a bunch of people, we should have a direction. I mean, where are people yeah. Yeah. in this yeah. when you, when you come in? Cause it, I'm guessing it's a, it's a wide variety, but yeah, no, it, I would say there's no one we've ever talked to that says, let's do this assessment before we get started. I think all of these organizations are already and have been in the middle of adopting data in a variety of ways for years, if not decades, right? I mean, since 2000, building data warehouses, 
since 2010, implementing these highly powerful analytics tools. Those were those decades of waves and both of those continue. But the third wave now is they're starting to wake up and realize we're not realizing any ROI on those investments. And one of the key blockers is that people sort of don't know how to use it. They don't even know where the data is, what's available to them. They're confused about where to find it. It's sort of a labyrinth. And these tools, yeah, I took a training six months ago, a year ago, two years ago, but I don't really use it on a daily basis and I've kind of forgotten. And um, they're starting to kind of wake up to the fact that the gap now is in knowledge and skill, uh, Mm -hmm. maybe to some degree more than data and technology. Uh, And so now they're saying, okay, well, hey, we need to come up with some kind of a strategy to... And also, they're starting to realize that there are a lot of people within those organizations that are feeling completely left behind. Like It's starting to be a revolution and a wave where everybody's supposed to get on the bandwagon, but they're starting to look around saying, there's a lot of people that really don't even feel close to being able to, to be involved mm-hmm. in this dialogue. So I think that that's what we've seen, you know, and we, we do see a little bit what you described. Someone saying our leadership told us that, you know, because they a family member is going through a data science program and now they're getting all jazzed about it. Something kind of like that. We've heard that in fact, this last week. Um, so there's some of that, but mostly it's middle management. You know, it's someone a couple levels down from the CDO, hopefully paired with someone in the training and development organization of a company or one or the other of those two is typically who we're talking to. Um, and they're mostly saying, okay, we're, we're kind of hitting, hitting some roadblocks here and we need to figure out how to get clear of them. Um, I would say that's kind of what I would typically yeah. see. Now, again, I'm seeing a small and biased subset because it's only the people come. We haven't spent any money on advertising. It's just the people coming to us. So by already, by definition, they're self-selecting and they're indicating that they're interested in moving forward. So it's hard for me to answer the question, what do organizations sure. in general look like, you know, but those are the people that are seeking this out right now. Now, now, how do you actually do this, right? Imagine you're talking to a prospective client that's listening right now and is saying, man, mm-hmm. that's me. I've got, mm-hmm. you know, and, and I would imagine the bigger the company, the more things I've got, right? I remember, yeah, working yeah. at Facebook, we had every BI tool under the sun. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> no at one has one point, tool, yeah. <laughs> at some point you end up, you know, because, oh, the marketing team went to a conference and they saw this thing and then the sales team went to a sales conference and they saw this thing and they all have yep. their credit cards and it costs 20 bucks to sign up and bam, now we have mm-hmm. contracts with 15 different analytics providers and whatever, right? Mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. Yeah. so how, do you, how do you get me from there, right? If I have this company and I have all these tools and I have all this stuff, I know, I know that, there's mm-hmm. some juice to squeeze out of this rock, but how do I do that? Like, what yeah. is the process? Mm-hmm. Like, walk me through how you go from yeah. whatever that is to this, you know, this future state. So what we're working on with our level two program is just what you said, what is the process? So let's come with the, come up with the process. It maybe doesn't matter what your tool is. Um, let's come up with the framework we can use to approach data questions and data problems so that we teach people to think about data, you know? And so I think you can uh, imagine many scenarios where, okay, we've got a data set and we've got to be able to look into it and, and answer some questions before we make some decisions about a project or an initiative. And you might say, oh, well, let's commonize the tool. Every I'm, When I was at Medtronic before, right before, actually at the time we met, I was just finishing up my time at Medtronic, a medical device company, and we were based out of Northridge. And at that time, the corporate headquarters out of Minneapolis would not let us look at anything but Tibco Spotfire. That's it. We couldn't mm-hmm. talk about other tools. We couldn't buy other tools. It was the stormtrooper approach. This is your tool. That's all you can use for any analytics questions, period. But then, like you said, well, lo and behold, there's all these other tools all over the place just popping up, people going around those, circumventing those, those rules and limitations. So instead of saying to people, okay, you have a data question, let's give you a certain tool, and sorry, that's all you can use. Instead, let's say you, you have a data problem or question, and you've got a variety of tools at your disposal. Probably some of them you're comfortable with, some of them you aren't. Now let's give you a framework with which you can apply your problem in question to the, uh, to, to the data you have in front of you, uh, leveraging as many of those tools or not as many of them, but the right ones, as few of them really uh, as you need (laughs) and no more. Right. Uh, but, uh, that's what we're trying to work on is, is what we call the framework. So we have a, a Mm -hmm. kind of a four step process to help people go through that entire process. And then also going the next step and teaching them. Hey, did you know a join and a VLOOKUP are related? 
hey, did you know you can do that in Tableau Prep or Power Query Editor? Those companies, those organizations aren't really telling you about those connections and bridges between these tool feature function um, modules or, or you know, training programs, but they are there. And once you know that, it's actually a very empowering thing because people realize there's, they, they already know, they've already seen some of it, you know. It's, it's really fun to teach someone SQL and then show them how they can use drag and drop tools to conduct some of those same queries uh, in a visual way. And then they realize, okay, hey, those are sort of similar types of things I'm doing now. And so I see the connections between them. And now we get out of the concern that we need to um, you know, decide on one tool and train everybody in that. It's just not reality. So the reality is mm-hmm. we need an approach to use to combine tools and data with problems. So part of that's a thinking approach. Part of that's a tool-based approach. And so we're trying to develop a program that kind of combines all those aspects and elements and then roll that out. You know, oftentimes though, to be honest, right, a company says, okay, that's great, Ben. We love your framework and we love the tool-based approach, but hey, we really just want you to train it all in tool X or tool Y. And mm-hmm. so we say, okay, you know, we'll do that. You want, you want us to just focus on that one tool? We can. But we're going to let them know, you know, that there's there are other alternatives and that there are commonalities between maybe some of these different approaches so that they'll learn, so that they can take what they, I mean, so much of learning is taking what you already know and connecting it to things you need to know. And so mm, that's a big part of, of what we try to do um, when we teach. Tell me about train. this. Tell me about this framework. So what is the framework mm-hmm, mm-hmm. that yeah. you're talking about? Is there a structure to it? Yeah. I mean, I think I've yeah. maybe heard it before and seen it on your website, but break it down for me. What is yeah. this uh, data framework you're talking about? Yeah, so we we kind of see it. Sometimes you see these processes like a circle or a cycle, um, but we more vi- envision it like a staircase. So you're sort of on a journey to a higher level. There's four levels that we uh, teach. One is um, just uh, wondering, right? So it's, it's just wondering what is happening, observing, questioning, hypotheses, also then taking that and gathering data. Uh, second step is where we look at the shape or the structure of the data. So preparing data for analysis, pivoting, joining, combining, you know, unions, cleaning dirty data, just getting it ready. You know, Next step then would be uh, the discovery phase where you're actually in the data and exploring it, seeing what's there, doing some analysis, trying to see if it's statistically significant, practically significant, you know, trying to figure out if you need to get more data and kick out of your cycle and come back again. And then mm-hmm. lastly would be this process where you actually use all of that to, to mature or grow uh, by presentations, by decisions, by communicating. And so then you're creating something uh, notable and delivering it or enacting it. So all of that spells wisdom. Um, so d- wondering inputs, uh, structure, shape, D for discovery, outputs, and then mature. So wisdom is the process we're teaching. And so, yeah, again, in each one of those little boxes of this flow chart, you can imagine four columns. And for those of you who are watching or listening, you can just see it on our website at the dataliteracy.com in the training on level two. So mm-hmm. four columns, W, S, D, M, and then it's a flow chart where you connect the dots between those. But acknowledging all along that it's a messy process. It's an iterative process. <laughs> you bounce out of that so many times and go back around because you notice something you didn't think you were going to notice. And, mm-hmm. you know, all of a sudden you're, you're starting over and Hey, that's, that's part of it. And that's great. I mean, in some ways that's better than trying to rigidly adhere to, you know, some li- linear process when you really need to be more flexible than that. So that's a big yeah. part of it, I think too. It- it reminds me a bit of the thing Chris Stolte did, the whole flow or the Zen of Tableau mm-hmm. kind of a thing, where there was like that process of, and and it, I mean it, it's he maybe put some words to it, but like it w- has been around forever. The whole challenge previously to to what Tableau did, which was really make um, make it all accessible, this whole exploratory mm-hmm. flow type type uh, process was you know you would you would send in a request to the data warehousing team for a set of data. <laughs> And you would yeah. get some some type of website that you could download something into Excel. And then you'd have a few Excel junkies that could do amazing things with it. You know, and Excel mm-hmm. is still mm-hmm. yeah. super prevalent, super valuable. But like, exactly. they could do really cool things. But inevitably, you would have an answer that you didn't anticipate. 
right? Mm -hmm. And then it would Mm -hmm. be crap. Now we have to go back (laughs) and submit another request and it's going to take us six weeks because we're out of queue, right? And now, and there's only, so there's a bottleneck there. So Tableau cracked that Mm -hmm. open and said, Mm -hmm. hey, forget that. Let's let you have the ability to kind of just flow through it. And so that process you're describing here, the wisdom one kind of is similar, right? In that you go Mm -hmm. through it and as you go through, you're going to bounce out and go, oh, Mm -hmm. wait a minute. Maybe we need to reframe the question. Maybe it's not, yeah. you know, was that marketing campaign right? Maybe it's, should we be doing more video? Or, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Kind of mm-hmm. looking at things from different aspects of, of why something was good or bad and, and, and honing in on that, right? Is that, is that fair exactly. to say that yeah, it's totally. a similar kind of thing? Yeah. Yeah, you want to keep people in the flow, right? The more they have to, the more they have to stop and wait, um, the more you risk they lose that intuitive spark that they're, they're, that are, that's causing the engine to turn. Uh, the more you risk, and we've all been in this environment where two, three weeks later, you get the new report back and the climate changed so quickly that it's not even a relevant business problem anymore, you know, so Mm -hmm. you missed an opportunity there. Um, so yeah, I I think that highly effective, uh, data discoverers are able to stay in the flow, almost losing track of time. You know, it's like that beautiful thing. In fact, I think, um, I mean, in a lot of ways, it feels like you're playing, if you get into that mode, uh, that that mode uh, where you lose track of time and you're just uh, not also thinking about the UI of the tools you're using, it's just more about what you're learning and your thought processes that are happening. And so that's the idea. You know, you want to get people fluent enough with the tools and the process that they just really unlock those real results and in the shortest amount of time possible. Um, because yeah, some, sometimes times of the essence. Well, yeah, it's. I mean, it's almost kind of reminds me of like playing music or something where, you know, and when you're starting out, you're just learning how to play the instrument. But then when you get to the point, you can get into this flow state, right? And this is why jazz yeah. is so great. It's one of those things, but like jazz, it sounds weird to people that don't understand what's going on. But the reason it sounds weird is because these people have achieved, they're doing things wrong on purpose, right? They're experimenting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're, they're doing, <laughs> right. you know, they're, they're doing it. that. And that's, that's kind of where, where it goes, where, where you're improvising and you're thinking and it kind of changes, you know, what you're doing, but you have to get the tool on all those things out of the way. Right. Yeah, exactly. That. So, right. Yeah. Right. And also the process too, you know, um, we teach it almost like I think of it, like the, the jazz analogy is perfect. Uh, you learn it step by step slowly. And then eventually like scaffolding that you put up in place to put up, to create a building, you know, when you're done, the scaffolding is gone. So we actually tell them, we're going to teach you this process, but the goal is that you forget about the process altogether. You know, you're going to learn the steps one by one by one, nice and steady and slow. And then you're going to start doing it. You're going to start doing faster and faster and faster to the point where you're not even really thinking about the process anymore because those Mm -hmm. steps are more intuitive. And then, you know, just like a jazz artist, you might break the steps and jump around and uh, know when you can take shortcuts, know when you can skip steps because you've done it enough times now and you have that experience that you don't have to follow it so closely into the letter. I'll never forget the time I took my youngest son snowboarding and he was doing really well on his heel edge for anybody who snowboarded, but for some reason he couldn't do his toe edge. You know, he would just not really do that. So he just go heel to heel down the hill and he was really stuck there. And that was uh, a problem. So I said, okay, he was kind of in tears. He was a little kid at the time, maybe 12 or 13, he was in tears. And so he said, dad, I you know, can't get toe edge. Right. I said, okay, man, Hey, let's get to the top of the lift. Now I'm just going to go stand over here on the hill. I just want you to go on your toe edge to me and then sit down. That's it. So you did that and flopped onto the snow. I said, great. Now I'll go down a little farther. Now I want you to go and then I want you to turn and come to me. And so we did that, sat down. Okay, great. We'll do it a third time. You'll do two turns. So we went really slowly, deliberately, step by step, thinking about each movement very carefully, you know, exactly what are you doing with your feet? How are you moving your, you know, and shifting your balance? Uh, and now he, I can't even keep up with him, you know? <laughs> so the idea is you have to learn it slowly and deliberately at first, but the last thing I want to do with this process is give someone some shackles that they're stuck with, that they have to follow some rigid process and all these steps that Ben told me I have to go through. That's not the point. The point is let's learn all the processes and the steps and why they're important. And then you're going to get good enough about it that you have to stop. You don't have to start. You don't have to think about it anymore. It's, you know, it's because freeing. It, it becomes it's, second, it's second nature. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it frees is. you a little bit because now you know that you have a, 
um, a method for actually getting an answer or delivering right. something of value, uh, whereas before you might have just been wandering, right? So now yeah, talk and to doing me. damage, you know, doing damage, like flying ahead, like just like you know, if he was trying to snowboard without knowing how to turn and whatnot, and just crashing yeah. into somebody, which is what he did. Yeah. He would just go straight down that hill because he didn't know how to turn. <laughs> so I was like, okay, we got a problem, and I think that's what happened with data. People ran ahead and just started using it without thinking about. The, the pitfalls without thinking about what they needed to be careful about, you know, and mm -hmm. so making, making plenty of mistakes in the process, I'm sure, as I have done. So, of course, as we all do now, talk yeah. to me about the people that can benefit from mm -hmm. data literacy. Is it just your statisticians? Is it just your Excel jockeys? Who is it that yeah. really should know these things and can benefit the most? I think right now we would break up an organization into two camps that we're serving well right now. And I think that there are two more camps we're working on. So at the, and I can think of it maybe as like a pyramid, you know, in terms of the number of people. So at the bottom of the pyramid, you have the most number of people. And those are, I hate the term data consumers, but people usually know right away what it means. They're not themselves working with raw data. They're just reading charts and graphs that other people are creating and consuming facts and figures and reports. And so that's, you know, pretty much everyone is doing that at some point. And so at the beginning, we're just saying, okay, everyone needs to have a common language about how to speak about data and its value and, and where it's useful. But then at some point, you kind of jump this barrier in the triangle, right? Imagine like a big wedge that's missing across the horizontal sort of axis of the triangle. And then you jump into this data worker camp where these are people that now don't break out into hives when they get sent a spreadsheet or get connected to a database because it's what they do. And they often think of themselves as data people. Um, they aren't always in IT uh, because of self-service analytics. They might be in the business now, and that's great. They may not even have data in their title, uh, but they're working with raw data fairly regularly. And now they need to be the ones to learn this process I was describing, You know where they're actually... Um, working with raw data and, and turning it into insights. But then I think there's a, the two levels above are um, the, the data scientist bucket. And so many people understand that differently. I mean, to me, that just means you're using some advanced algorithms and methods to uh, sort of automate uh, insight finding within most likely relatively large data sets. You know, it's sort of a special case of analysis mm -hmm. and statistics and I think that we don't really have a lot for those or, uh, groups yet. And that's probably a next year kind of a thing for us, just looking at our pipeline. And the other audience we want to focus on a little more um, specifically uh, in the future is the leadership audience, because we need data savvy executives in the companies that we're working for. And I think that there's a specific program for them. It's probably connected or related to the decision making class I teach at the University of Washington. Uh, also combined with this data literacy score assessment um, findings that we have about building, you know, highly effective data cultures. And so mm -hmm. I think I need to bring those together into a next year, probably into a program for execs. Yeah, that would be super interesting. And I think that's, you know, I mean, so, so with that, everyone mm -hmm. should be able to read charts and understand them, right? So can we yeah. talk a, a little bit about different kinds of charts and maybe, sure. I don't know, like <laughs> yeah. what's good, what's bad, or are, are, are there yeah. any universal truths here? I mean, <laughs> there are lots of, yeah. there are lots of hotly debated things and mm -hmm. me and you probably mm -hmm. agree on a lot of this, but, but get, mm -hmm. get, give me the breakdown. So what are the common yeah. chart types that everyone should know how to read? Mm -hmm. And, and then what are the ones maybe people shouldn't, should avoid or be, you know, raise an eyebrow when you see it, you know, that kind of a thing. Yeah. So, so, yeah, so yeah. for someone listening, like, okay, like five, six minutes, like what should I know about yeah. charts and chart types? Okay. Okay. So, you know, there's a lot of talk about charts and chart types. Uh, many people say things like pie charts are evil. Um, and I hear that idea a lot in the data world. My philosophy is that they're all useful and we need to consider the solution set and keep it as broad and wide as possible. So I'm not banishing any chart type to oblivion. I'm keeping I them mean, all chord in diagrams. Mind. Come on. Chord <laughs> yeah, diagrams. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely, man. I saw a great one about muesli, a chord diagram about all the ingredients in muesli. I was mesmerized. No, I'm <laughs> but no, I, I do think they're, yeah, even the crazy ones, you know, even the crazy ones, there's special cases where they apply and where they're helpful. So if I say, what are the main ones? Not the chord diagram, not a Sankey yeah. diagram, you know, whatever. I think the main ones are um, bar chart because we're talking about position and length combined. 
pie charts where we now convert it to a polar, uh, you know, a polar um, scheme instead of a linear scheme. Scatter plots where we're talking about um, points in an XY plane Cartesian coordinate system. By the way, a, a map, uh, a symbol map is just a special case of that where X and Y are latitude and longitude. And then some kind of a line chart, right, where it's more like uh, it's a special case of a scatter plot where the horizontal axis is time. Okay, so mm-hmm. and it doesn't always have to be horizontal, by the way, but that would be the rule of thumb. Now, those are the four, I would say, like core chart types and other ones are related to them or can be found kind of in some way connected to them. Now, they all go back to uh, different encodings and graphical marks. So we take marks like squares or circles or lines. We encode, we take our data and we encode those marks with properties that are derived from the data, color, size, angle, position. And so those things to me are um, really the, like the building blocks of charts and graphs. So in level one, we teach the building blocks, you know, and then we say, okay, now that you know how those building blocks can be combined in a way that's expressive of what's in the data and that's effective uh, in the sense that it lets other people get a pretty accurate understanding of what's there and gives them good guesses as to the true proportions in the data. Now let's take the next step and talk about chart types and group them together. You know, what are ones that express part to whole relationships? Well, that would be a pie chart. Uh, okay, great. So you have a pie chart, it's expressing part to whole, maybe, but what are ways that you can use that in in a confusing way? You know, maybe, for example, the slices don't have to 100% or, you know, something like that, where you're not even showing a total of anything. It's just three mm-hmm. out of 10 companies. And now you're trying to say that this is the the share they have, but I'm giving the impression that it's the whole thing. So what are ways you can, can convert the data into encodings, into chart types that's going to be confusing or that's going to be clarifying. So those are the the kinds of philosophies that I have. I mean, if I were to, you know, drill down or boil down my philosophy into a couple sentences, it's that there are no hard rules or rules written in stone. There's just rules of thumb. Uh, like music, you're going to be, get really talented. You have to learn those rules first, like music. And when you are really talented, you'll know when to break those rules. It's a great effect. Mm -hmm. And that's a beautiful thing when that happens. Um, And I'll never kick out a chart type from my toolkit. It'll always be in there. I may not use it. I may not use it very often, maybe hardly ever, but it's still there. Now, do you um, subscribe to the Tough D slash Stephen Few uh, data to ink ratio thing (laughs) of where you want to, or whatever they call data pixel ratio. I don't know, whatever whatever you want to call it. Um, yeah, not, you know, and, not at all. Yeah, yeah. So, 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 tell me about that. Like, what are your thoughts on yeah. that? I mean, what what is that first for someone that maybe doesn't know? Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm, then, mm-hmm. and then, um, what what are your guys' thoughts? And do you teach this as a part of your, you know, chart yeah. building block uh, lesson? Sure. Yeah. So, data to ink that came from Tufty, as you mentioned, data to pixel, maybe in a more digital world. But it's the idea that the more the ink or pixels is directly data, then the better off you are. So. This was in response to, and understandably, a backlash to um, what he called chart junk, things that people were slapping into charts that were sort of tacky or even sometimes overly sensational or worse, you know, just downright ugly. We all remember the days in the, well, those of us who are our age right then, we'll remember the days (laughs) in the 90s of clip art and everything. And so I get it. There was a backlash against that. That's fine. But I don't think though, I, I believe actually, if you go farther back than Tufty, quite a bit farther back, about 100 years, there was an author named Willard Cope Brinton. And he wrote a couple books that, um, in fact, I don't think you can find a photograph of Brinton in existence. Not that I know wow. of. We'd probably have to, we'd have to dig more. He was sort of almost lost to time. But some of those digital uh, uh, digitization of book efforts that happened by Google and others surfaced some of his books for many of us in the data world um, you know, long after they were, they were dusty and forgotten. And so he talks about the phrase I like to use is the judicious embellishment of charts. So those Mm. words to me are really what hit home because you have data and you're showing charts, but there are some times where you want to embellish them with a photograph, an image, an icon, a logo. uh, And you want to do that in a way that's judicious. Now that's a gray area. You know, what might be tasteful to me might be tacky to you. Uh, and so it, it isn't a perfect science, but I do think there are times when we can use image, even art to great effect 
to evoke emotions, to enhance cognition and memory, to tie in the human element. I remember one time at Medtronic, I mentioned that company, I was presenting some data to the executives in a day-long product review board meeting. I knew this was back in the early 2000s. They were going to be staring at their Blackberries the whole time. So I wanted to wake them up. So I gave them the data about how this product we had launched was doing in the marketplace. And then I showed photographs of people using it. I played audio from the helpline about people complaining about it. And it was all toward a specific recommendation I was making, but I added the human element. And I added the human element using techniques and methods that I think Tufty would frown on, or at least Mm -hmm. his books would suggest are um, poor practice. But I'll tell you, it got their attention. It got them to release some funding a couple weeks later to make some of the changes we were requesting to deal with these real human beings and their complaints. You know, these customers of ours that were literally booing us on social media, you know, with those letters, boo. And so I needed them to see that. Well, I'm not going to see, I'm not going to show that to them in a bar chart. I'm going to show that to them with a screenshot of the boos and how many zeros and how many exclamation marks. And they get to see the quirky name of the person's Twitter account and laugh about that. And see the photograph and say, oh, that kind of looks like my niece or whatever, you know. So those human connections I think we make during data presentations, they make all the difference in the world. I mean, I got their attention with it. Now you might say, oh, Mm -hmm. well, it is a double-edged sword, you know, because I can be overly sensationalistic and people are, journalists are. So we need to be careful with those. And it is very easy to, uh, to think you're doing something effective while actually that might backfire on you. So it's risky. Uh, but uh, that's my philosophy. We teach that yeah. we teach, te- you know, we teach adding, we do teach though. And I think that there's something to be said in, you know, Cole Naflick in her book, data storytelling with data. She mentions this too. Hey, let's eliminate clutter. Okay. Look, look at I, I, my philosophy is look at every pixel or ink or whatever, and ask if it's doing work for you and how can you articulate every pixel on that screen? What work is it doing for you? If it's not doing any work, sure. Get rid of it. But sometimes a little icon or a photograph, or heaven forbid, a clip art. Maybe I'm doing a chart about <laughs> clip art. Well, I'm probably going to put, what if I'm showing them the cheesiest clip art? Okay, well, there's going to probably be the clip art on the chart. You know. So again, that's why I don't think it makes sense to have those uh, hard and fast rules that people feel, and also a culture of fear where people feel obliged to mindlessly follow them or else they're going to get slammed by mm-hmm. some guru. And, I, and frankly, I think that that is what the previous generation of data gurus kind of built. And I think you and I and others in the Tableau world, I think we broke that spell and along with others, you know, in the uh, early two, 2010s by saying, you know, no, there are cases where those are effective and, and valid uses. And I'm not going to be afraid of some person just because they have a lot of great selling books and what they're going <laughs> to say to me, you know, and right, that happened. Right. We would do things and they would really, you know, kind of, we saw a lot of backlash from them and we just said, we're doing it anyway, you know? And now I think mm-hmm. it's a much more uh, open and, and inclusive and frankly, creative, frankly, fun kind of world to be in than what I think we had when we started uh, yeah. 10 or 20 years no, that, ago. Yeah. That's great. I love the judicious use of that. That's yeah. uh, because mm-hmm. you're right. I mean, it's uh you know, certainly, uh, you know, and, and maybe maybe some of the backlash of the Tufties and Fuse of the world was because the tools were so filled with junk, maybe. Yeah, you know, <laughs> right. <laughs> like, sure. maybe, maybe that oh, was yeah. a maybe that was an appropriate response. I don't know. But yeah, certainly it's we're in a different place now. So talk to me about one thing that I don't I mean, you know, this is goes, you know, super far back. But why do we even have charts? Why don't we just look mm-hmm, at numbers? Mm-hmm, you know, wh- mm-hmm, why mm-hmm. do we do these things? Yeah. Like, is there yeah. some history there? Like, like, what is it, you know? Yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, if you trace the history back, I think we've been encoding quantitative information in using these, using these channels like position and color and whatnot. I mean, for millennia, even think of the abacus. What were they doing? They were changing the position of the beads on this rack to be able to count and do business in the marketplace. So they're already using position of objects to, to, to capture quantitative information. You know, I think it was turned into the chart uh, kind of world, probably in like the 1700s when you start seeing at the time, right? Think of it like they were capturing the height of rivers, like the sign. And they were, they had actually put the posts in, in the water and track the height. And they're trying to figure out when it's going to be a flood, right? They're trying to predict that. And they would use the heights of these rods in the water. And then they would say, oh, let's just kind of put that on a page and say, 
here is, we'll draw the height of the rod mm. last week and then we'll draw the height of the rod this week. And then we'll just keep going, you know, we'll just keep doing that and putting them side by side by side. And then someone came along, his name was William Playfair. Actually, he was following on the work of another person um, named, um, let's see. Well, actually, some of it came from astronomy earlier in the 1500s, like Christoph Scheiner and others trying to plot the stars and the position of even like sun sunbursts on the, on the sun. Uh, but then others started ch- uh, charting using those same techniques, not to use, not to, not to show physical phenomena anymore, like the position of stars or the height of a river, but to use them in an abstract way. For example, to show the balance of trade between England and Denmark. Oh, we can use some of these same techniques we've been using to show size and position in the physical world to now talk about other numbers that don't have really a direct connection to length or position right it's Mm -hmm. money it's about changing currency so Mm -hmm. they did that they had that leap in the 1700s william playfair and others and then they started to get more creative like with florence nightingale and her coxcomb charts where she's showing mortality of these uh british uh soldiers and field hospitals during the crimean war uh using that to uh advocate and uh and lobby really the queen of england for uh, victoria at the time i believe for some sanitation improvements in those in those hospitals that were just really in terrible shape you know i mean we think about past you know we thought a lot in the last year or so about communicable diseases you know and so mm-hmm. they they had squalid conditions so anyway the point is i think we've just seen this continual development over the last few hundred years of these chart forms it's now becoming almost even a science a, prof- a dedicated profession with its own society and multiple tools that are, you know, uh, focusing on visual analytics like Tableau and others. So it's just become a very mature thing now, but yeah, it does go back a long way. And, and I think the reason why we're doing it is because this is the innate part I meant about why no one's data illiterate because our visual cortex just picks up on these cues almost without us thinking about it. We talk about right. pre-attentive attributes in the class and the fact that you look at a chart, you notice something before you even really pay attention to it. It just comes off the screen or the page, an outlier or a huge spike in a line chart, right? It's impossible not to notice it. And that conveys these interesting patterns and trends and outliers that are in the data that would be really hard to pick up if you were scanning a table of numbers. Mm -hmm. Maybe some friends of mine over my career in finance have been good at that, but I've never figured it out. I really find, not that the table's bad. I mean, it captures the precision. It, It allows us to record and, you know, transform the data. But the chart gives us that that picture of what's going on there, and you know the, the, the saying's true: the picture can can convey a thousand words, right? So that's well, why I think we we visualize it. You know, and, yeah. and it makes sense in terms of how we've evolved as mm-hmm. uh, as a species here that we are very visual creatures. Yeah, and yeah. so we take, like you said, visual input much very quickly, right? So if we can convert this giant list of numbers into something that is more tuned with how we've evolved, then we can get to that insight faster, right? Exactly. Now, exactly. Now talk one thing that I saw recently and I kind of chuckled and I was uh <laughs> I was teasing Francois Agenstadt, who I still chat with mm-hmm. uh, regularly about was animations in Tableau. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. forget forget animations in Tableau, but just animating data how do you feel yeah. about this you like you know there's some great mm-hmm. uh, uh cha- channels like vox does this a lot and there's a lot of great yeah. series on netflix where they use animation at, yeah. and data as a storytelling technique like how do you feel about that is that a good i yeah. mean it, you know where and, and, and does that apply even to a uh you know a walmart or a, a regular mm-hmm. business mm-hmm. out there mm-hmm. right i got you yeah i mean I, I think it's a it can be a very powerful technique and um I think it can actually uh, be used to great effect to help teach someone about the chart type itself. So I'll come back to that in a minute. But like every technique, I think it can be overused. Um, remember back in the day, we had PowerPoint introduce the ability to animate slides. Mm-hmm. And then for a while there, for maybe like nine months, everybody animated everything. And everything was yep. flying in left and right and bouncing around and spinning around. And then eventually everybody said, okay, enough. <laughs> so <laughs> it's very little, it's very little of that now. Uh, and thankfully, right. I mean, so many, like I got dizzy and so everybody else did. And so just because a tool let you do it, you did it. And that was like, that was not a great reason to do it. Uh, but at the same time, there are some r- scenarios in which showing a process or an idea 
in a slide and adding animation is the difference between someone being totally confused about the process or the idea and someone totally getting it. So Mm -hmm. I think that it's something you want to use, again, judiciously. Let me give an example of when I've seen it be uh, useful. You know, Pew Research, this is research arm, did this uh, study where they showed that really only a couple, two thirds of Americans really know how to read a scatter plot. They couldn't even answer a question about teeth decay and sugar consumption, right? Um, And so if you're showing someone a scatter plot or a group of people in the audience, there's a good chance that a handful of them, or maybe even like as many as a third or perhaps more, don't know what it is and what it means and how to read it. They just don't know. Um, and that's the reality. And it's like, really? Like, yeah, that's that's actually the case. So uh, at least that's what research and studies seem to show. So what if instead of just flashing up a, a scatter plot and saying, here you go, you make sense of it. And then just going like, you know, I'm confused. What if you just started with nothing but the axis? That's it. And you said, hey, this x-axis is all about sugar consumption okay the y-axis is about how many cavities people have now every dot is going to be a country i'm going to take the dots literally take the dots from a map drop them onto the x-axis and then say let's move them to the place where they have uh, a spot on that horizontal axis now you know which countries have the most sugar consumption oh look at this country over here yeah they eat a lot of sugar Look at that country over there. No, nah, not so much. Now, all these dots are stuck on the x-axis. Why don't we do something about it? We have all this space above. Why don't we use it? Let's move them. And we'll move them up comparatively based on how many cavities people tend to get. Oh, take a look at that. The ones on the right went way high. The ones on the left didn't. See what I mean? Now, you can see that countries with higher sugar consumption tend to have more cavities per person. And so if I, that's like a 30-second thing. Walmart can do that, mm-hmm. a 30-second thing. If the, And, and yeah. instead of just showing the states as like independent states where there's a gray area between what I show you, make those dots move, make them jump up and down and they don't have to bounce. There's no need to add a gratuitous Mm. flare or anything. Just have them gently and easily move. And now tools like Tableau, like you mentioned with Francois and others, they added that capability to me. That's a data literacy tool because you can use it to teach what a chart means and you can actually animate the the changes between states of a chart, maybe a bar moving from the bottom in 10th position all the way to the top (laughs) is something you do want to emphasize by moving that bar, literally seeing them, seeing the bar jam to the top of the, of the page, you know, the screen, instead Mm -hmm. of just having it disappear and then re-showing it again with that bar in a higher spot. So anyway, that's a long winded answer, but I think that uh, animations can be, yeah, they can really be used to teach people in the room what the charts are and what they mean. And think of it from that point of view, you're actually going to bring them along with you. I think you can do it in a way that isn't like overbearing or yeah. talking down, talking down to someone who already knows what the chart means. You know, yeah, you yeah. can just do it in quick, quick one, two, three, four steps. And there we go. There's our chart. I think building charts like that is something that is useful. And we right, should think about that because, yeah. In the end, you'll have some relatively complex chart that, like right. you said, a lot of people may not even like it's too much, you know, th- there's definitely, yeah. <laughs> I've, we've all seen this where you look at something and you go, I'm not even going to bother. You know, I, right. I, it's funny. I have this thing where I take pictures of the, uh, parking, you know, when you go to a, a parking garage and you have to pay, um, mm-hmm. and there's, there's the machine. I, I take pictures of a lot of the interfaces cause they are so <laughs> insanely complex. There's like blinking things and arrows and all these different colors. Right. So <laughs> Something like a scatter plot or a dashboard, let's say, with multiple charts, with multiple things going on. I mean, imagine you're a, a high-level executive at, at, at a large company and someone hands you this dashboard with five different charts on it and color galore and axes and changes and filters and all this stuff. You could very easily get to the point where you're like, sorry, dude, I, I, <laughs> just yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm going to ask someone else to tell me the, the answer I want. I'm never even going to try right. this thing. So right. if you can animate it, in a way that is more ex, uh, kind of, yeah, handholds you to where now mm-hmm, you look mm-hmm. at it and you get it. Yeah, mm-hmm. I, I could see how that could be so useful. Yeah, introduce yeah. things little by little, kind of bring them out in stepwise fashion. Because to your point, if you've been working with the data for a long time building a chart, it may not occur to you that there's four or five encodings in there, each one with mm-hmm. its own legend. It's just, it's mm-hmm. intuitive to you because you made it and you've been staring at it for a long time. So it hel- it's, I think it's helpful to say, okay, let me put myself in the mind of the person receiving my presentation or looking at this dashboard 
And am I creating something like the parking structure uh, panel where I'm just going to hit that darn button and say, can, <laughs> how do I get in? Can you, can you let me in please? You know, yeah. because I don't want to figure out uh, how to give them my phone number and whether that means something's going to come out at me or not. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, there's um, I think I couldn't agree more. I think that, but at the same time, you know, you're going to turn people off if it's just gratuitous and yeah, ca- trying to catch their attention. Okay, well, if that's all it does, if all, and I guess the question is, if all it's trying to do is catch their attention, that's it, the motion, the animation. Okay, that might be valid, but if that's the only value it brings, really question it because it might just turn people off and they might mm-hmm. say, you didn't need to do that. That was extra work. If it's an executive, they might say, why am I paying you to do all this fancy <laughs> stuff, you know? But if it's helping them see something, they won't ask, they won't make that criticism. Oh, great. Thanks. Right. Now I get it. You know, that's so, the difference yeah. between when something just works and, and something doesn't. Right. Yeah. You know, there's, there's a lot of times <laughs> so, you're like, Oh, that makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Yeah. And now, now l- let me ask you one, one follow up on that because in terms of the encodings, we have what uh, position mm-hmm. on page size, color, uh, any other kind of decorative things like a border or something like that, or, you know, representing the symbol differently. Now, yeah. is there uh, is there too much? Are there any kind of rules of thumb with that? Mm-hmm. I mean, a scatter plot's mm-hmm. a good example where you have two axes right. and the things can be all over the page, and you have every other type of uh, manipulation to the the mm-hmm. data. Mm-hmm. Is is mm-hmm. there is there a point when you're like that's always too much, or is there like okay, never more than three? I don't know. Like like mm-hmm. like, is there anything that you know, kind of for someone that's maybe just looking at it, going, yeah, I want to use that, but how do I know it's too much? or too little yeah so you know hans rosling right uh yeah, the swedish physician yeah so if anyone doesn't know him you can just google the phrase the best stats you've ever seen and you can find his video on, on ted he's one of the i think one of the earliest ted talks maybe i don't know but he shows what you're describing you know a bubble chart where there's dots like a scatter plot but they're sized based on the country population and they're colored based on the region of the world and then he does even more. He puts them into motion. Now the bubbles are moving. Okay, so that's a lot going on, <laughs> you know. Yeah. And how does he how does he pull it off? Uh, because he's widely regarded as probably one of the best data storytellers of our lifetime. I mean, if you watch the video, you'll know what I mean. He's like a he's like it's like he's calling a horse race. I mean, he is so animated <laughs> and excited and passionate. He's talking about this bubble going there and China going from there to there. And I mean, he's into it. You know, sometimes he uses a stick to point. So that's what you have to do if you're going to throw that many variables at people and want them to understand something. You might need to pull a hands Rosling and actually talk them through it. You know. Um, because the more variables you throw at them, the more it's think of it like a give get ratio. You know, I don't have a hard fast rule, like no more than two or three or four. Uh-huh. I think of it like this, they're gonna have to give a certain amount of their time and attention to understand the encodings to orient themselves on what they're looking at. They're going to invest their own time and energy in that. Now, okay, what do they get out of that? If a little extra time and investment is going to get is going to result in a completely higher value for some reason, like maybe if I just show the bubbles by population, you're like, great, okay, that's fine. But then now if I throw the regional color in there, you see all the sub-Saharan African countries in a certain corner, perhaps, or something like that. And then you hit play and you see them race to a side real quick. Your eyes are watching those colors. So you're like, oh, wow, I, now I know something about that region of the world. If I hadn't added color, you would never have gotten that out of the, the experience. So it's just a give-get ratio to me. I mm-hmm. say, I yeah. I, once you get over three or four encodings, if you're adding if you're adding any more than that, you're you're asking for a lot. You're asking mm-hmm. your audience to to give a lot of their time and attention that maybe they don't have. This is why you see journalists just doing s- the simple stuff. Why? Because they're assuming they're getting five seconds of their readers' time if they're lucky, you know. So they got to get their message across quick. So they don't yeah. really do elaborate fancy stuff for the most part. I mean, some do, and that's state of the art type work, you know, that's winning the prizes and whatnot, but your average run of the mill story in a news site, it's a simple bar chart or a simple line chart. And you know, that's it. Right. Yeah. Um, and so that's why, because they, they're making, I would, my assumption is they're guessing that they just don't have that much of people's time and attention. And they can't be sure that that uh, audience, since it's such a broad audience, you know, mm-hmm. they can't be sure that they have the skill that the, and the knowledge that they need to, uh, to decode something fancier than that, right? So, yeah, uh, so that, that's what I think about it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, because it's it, definitely one of those things where probably one or two addi- like additive elements can make a world of difference, but at some point there's a diminishing returns, right? An example yes. I yep. have in one of my um, one of my fundamentals courses on uh, on um, on uh, chart types and stuff is I show you a bar chart and it's our top customers. And then I color code that by the profit of the customers. And you find out Mm -hmm. that the number one selling customer, the one that has bought the most, Mm -hmm. has a negative Mm -hmm. profit ratio. So it very, very quickly changes your perception of what you would call who is our best customer, right? And so if you're the sales team sending out bottles of booze or, you know, little bat gift baskets to your best customers, you may need to shift exactly who you're sending that to based yeah. on that. Right? And that's just one added. <laughs> Send them the lower quality. Yeah. They get the lower <laughs> quality wine. Yeah. That's <laughs> We've right. We've already put enough into them. Yeah. And well, I like right. your point about showing it to them in order first, I sh- because then it's like, you kind of create this um, dissonance, right? Where the reader says, oh, cool, that customer's great. And we're making a lot of money off of them. And you say, oh, yeah, well, check this out. And now it's like, oh, wow, wait a minute. And I'm completely, you took my understanding yeah. and you turned it upside down. And people don't forget those moments because they, you blew their mind, you know. And if you had just started with the whole thing and all the encodings all at once, they wouldn't have had that same effect. I don't think it would, you know what I mean? It would have yeah. just been, it would have just felt in, intimidating and they would have maybe, you would have lost more of them. Then if you did it in a stepwise fashion like that, you may have brought them along. And of course, we don't have the, always have that ability to mm-hmm. walk them through the data in that way. But when we do, to me, that's the way to do it. You can almost that's withhold the, some of those yeah. exclamation marks to certain points. Yeah, <laughs> that, it, it, that's the, the thing to, you know, to talk to Cole about, right, is kind of the, the storytelling aspect of it. Like you have the data, right. you have a chart that perfectly illustrates the points and the findings. But that's still not mm-hmm. enough, right? <laughs> you still right. have to know how <laughs> yeah. to walk someone through the process or whatever to get to where this perfect chart that you created in the end ha- has that aha moment. Otherwise, yeah, because you they didn't go on the journey with you, right? They just saw the end result. And so, yeah, so that's mm-hmm. a fascinating mm-hmm. part of it. Well, man, um, yep. Ben, I really appreciate all the time. It's been great talking to you. How can people yeah. find you? How can people learn yep. more about your company? Um, I'm sure more than a few yep. folks are listening going, I need this. So, uh, yeah. where, where, where should yeah. we send them? I hope so. So you can go to, uh, data literacy.com. So we were lucky enough to get that as our URL and that'll give you everything you need to know about what we do. Uh, I can be found more often than probably I should be on Twitter at data remix <laughs> or on, uh, on LinkedIn at, uh, at Ben R Jones. So yeah, happy to connect with anyone and, and, um, answer any questions they have and, and help them get, get a little further along the road there, you know, in their, their journey of, of data literacy, um, data fluency, whatever they want to call it. And it's been a pleasure. Thanks for having me, Ben. Really appreciate it. Great to, great to see you again. You know, it's been, uh, yeah. A long time. So yeah, absolutely. We can see in, in, in person sometime soon. Absolutely. I'd love that. All right. I hope you enjoyed that interview there with Ben Jones of dataliteracy.com. If you want to learn more, check the show notes or the description on the video below. We'll put links to everything he mentioned and really let us know what you think about that, whether that's leaving us a comment on YouTube or leaving us a rating on the podcast player of your choice. So thanks for watching yet again, everyone, and we'll see you back here in the next one.